<laughs> Dottie, now, come on now. <laughs> I tried hard on that song. It, it's just, it is a little out of my range. I, I even pitched it low so I could maybe get up there. I still couldn't get up there. But uh, anyway. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 8 today. Before we get there, I want to tell you about a little conversation I had over 30 years ago with a guy by the name of Phil Slate. Anybody know who Phil Slate is? He used to be the dean at Harding Graduate School. And I had heard back in, the, I'm going to guess, 87, 88, probably 88 would be my guess, a chapel speaker that uh, I don't even know what he spoke on, really. He spoke on, uh, I did at the time, obviously, but I, I've since forgotten. But it was probably... It was probably on hermeneutics, or it may have been on worship style. Who knows what it was on? Uh, I, I suspect it was on hermeneutics. But anyway, uh, I was talking to Phil afterwards at, uh, over there at Memphis, and I mentioned to him, I said, did you hear Brother So-and-So's uh, talk on whatever t topic it was? And he said, yeah, yeah. I said, well, what would you think? He said, well, he said, I think his talk reflected some unfinished thinking. And I've always hung on to that. Unfinished thinking. And Dottie, before we leave today, I want you to remind me to come back to unfinished thinking. Okay? But we're going to leave that for right now. And we're going to move over to 1 Corinthians 8. But we're going to come back to unfinished thinking. Now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. But the man who loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom all things came and for whom we live, and there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, to whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone knows this. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled, but food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak, for if anyone with a weak conscience sees you have this knowledge uh, eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause him to fall. An interesting passage. It's one that I often hear prefaced with, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like it's relevant. Uh, I would beg to differ on this one. I think it's probably one of the more relevant uh, passages uh, in Scripture, for a number of reasons. But, before we proceed along, and I do need to acknowledge, there are whole ki all kinds of different ways you can approach this passage. Many different ways you can go at it. And, I mean, you can look at the background stuff on this. I mean, there's a whole com commentary by Ben Witherington on just the background uh, social stuff that goes with this passage. We're not going to do that. I mean, we're not going to look at all the ancient temples and the fact that some of the ancient temples, you know, had dining halls, kind of like our fellowship hall. Uh, and, you know, when he talks here about uh, uh, when someone sees you eating in a temple, uh, that's probably not in the temple itself. It's probably in like a fellowship hall, kind of like we do. Uh, and, but we're, we're not going to go into all that. Uh, we're just not. You could spend a lot of time in this chapter talking about the weak brother, who is the weak brother, how should we treat the weak brother? Uh, when is the weak brother uh, manipulating the congregation to get his way? Uh, 
when are older brothers who are not weak pleading on behalf of the weak brothers so they can get their way and manipulate the congregation and hold it hostage to whatever they want to do. We could, we could do all that, but uh, I'm, I'm not going to go there either. Uh, Fred Craddock had an interesting uh, sermon on this once, and he talked a little bit about the struggle here uh, to find unity within a church when personal beliefs uh, conflict with community faith and community unity. Uh, and you could spend a lot of time on this with that. Because, you know, it's one thing for me to hold something personally and you to hold something personally and someone else to hold something that's different personally. And it's a whole total another issue for us to come together as a body and have faith, to have church. You know, there, there are two aspects to our, our faith. There is that personal dimension of faith, and then there's the community, uh, the community that comes together and speaks uh, as one and worships. And, you know, you can see the difficulty that Paul was having in trying to hold uh, some of those churches together with those vast, different personal beliefs that they had and getting them to come together and march, uh, you know, to the same tune. Uh, it just uh, isn't easy. I heard a sermon in St. Louis within the last, oh, at least last two months. That was, that was pretty good. And he used this passage, and he talked about uh, how we are not an island unto ourselves. Kind of going off what Paul says here at the, at the end about the weak brother. And, you know, we do not live as an island unto ourselves. And what we do affects others. And uh, what they do affects us. And it was good. He did a, he did a good job with it. But... Uh, I, I don't want to do any of that either. Uh, I have a, a different direction I'd like to go on this. But I think the best way to get started is to tell you about a, another uh, conversation I remember from over 30 years ago. There was a time when I was a part of an HSBS class. It was a, kind of a, a two-year, for lack of a better, uh, better way of putting it, it's kind of, it was kind of like a Harding's Votech for preachers, okay? Uh, you know, you, you go to a Votech, uh, learn how to tear an engine down. Well, it was kind of the down and dirty two-year program to try and get you up to speed uh, to, to where you can go out and preach. Uh, you, can, you can tell by me it, it didn't work, okay? So uh, you, you need more than two years. Uh, but anyway, I digress. I remember either after one of the classes, or we would take a break. They were like hour and 20 minute classes. They were, they were horribly long. So occasionally we'd have a merciful teacher that would give us a break about halfway through so we could uh, stretch our legs. And I remember uh, we were in 1 Corinthians 8, and I remember a brother, he was, <laughs> he was, uh, he was talking about this passage, and you just have to know, who, I, I think I remember who it was. There were about probably three or four of us, and whoever made the comment, I, I really don't know. But he, he, he said, you know, he said, Paul can fellowship polytheists. But he said, we can't stand to be around the Baptists. And I thought about that when he said that. You know, he's kind of got a point. He can, you know, Paul can fellowship polytheists. Can, I mean, the striking thing about this passage to me is the Apostle Paul does not make an issue out of polytheism. I mean, here's a guy who, who bills himself as a Jew of Jews, right? You know, a Pharisee of Pharisees. And, wh and what do we know about the Jews? What's, what's their favorite passage? You know, Devin's up here talking about it all the time, the Shema. You know, you remember it? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is... Anybody? One. Yep, he's one. Okay. Do you think Paul was a monotheist? Do you think any, he thought any of those, those, those silly graven images were anything other than silly graven images? I doubt it, seriously. You know, and the striking thing to me in this passage is Paul could fellowship people that didn't believe that or hadn't gotten over it or still had baggage from it, however you want to look at it. I suspect there are all three of them. People that still believe those other gods were real, some of them just kind of had some residual hangover, 
kind of like maybe some of y'all did as kids, you remember? When you're, uh, I'm looking at some of you who are old enough. Do you, do you remember any grandparents or anybody that had an issue with you going to the movie theater or playing cards? You know, and there for a while you had that residual hangover from it where you felt a little guilty every time you went to go see a movie or, or you played a, a game of cards. Some of you are way too young to, to have that residual hangover. But uh, some of you remember it. Well, that's, that, that may be some of what's going on here. Uh, but I suspect some of them actually believed it. Because Paul pretty much says that uh, in this passage, if you look at verse 7. He says, everyone has this, what? Knowledge. Not everyone knows this. Not everyone knows it. Now, the odd thing is, the odd thing is, you know, we within our fellowship have been very big on making a statement. In matters of faith, I'm getting this backwards. Let's, let's rephrase this. In matters of opinion, what? Anybody? Freedom. Freedom. In matters of faith, Unity, okay? Now, if you were to ask, if I was to ask you if monotheism would be a matter of faith to the Apostle Paul, wouldn't you think you'd check that box? I mean, I would. I mean, that's a big one, isn't it? Monotheism versus polytheism? Is this a matter of opinion, Paul, or is this a matter of faith? Do we need freedom here? Do we need unity here? What's up with that? But Paul doesn't even go there. You know, the odd thing about this passage that strikes me is Paul says, look, you've got some people, man, that, that, that their thinking is all messed up. You've got to get them in a workshop. I'm talking we need a retreat that's about a three-day, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and if we can pull it off, maybe a Monday holiday too, and we're going to have a retreat on monotheism. And we're going we're gonna to root out all this alien polytheistic belief and we're going to fix their thinking. But oddly enough, Paul doesn't say that. He does not say that. He says not everyone knows this. Not everyone knows it. And I think what was happening in this church, people's personal beliefs were beginning, beginning to tear at the fiber. I mean, you've got such a diverse group of people probably in this Corinthian church, if you can imagine. And everybody's personal beliefs were beginning to kind of tear at the fiber of that church. And Paul is trying, trying to hold it together. And he's saying, look, we in this church have different knowledge bases. Not everybody knows the same thing. Not everybody understands the same way. And we've got to find a way to put this together with all these people with different knowledge bases that know different things. He says we all know something, but we don't all know the same thing. And hold it together. And, and what's Paul's answer for that? In, in a simple word, four-letter word, starts with an L, ends with an E, Love, okay, love, okay. But I want to introduce you to, to something that is uh, similar to that, that's not stated here, but I think it's an idea that's useful for our thinking about other issues and dealing with other problems. Because even though, you know, the, applica the, 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 the context for this discussion in 1 Corinthians 8, it's out of date. I mean, we... we that, 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 ship is, that ship has sailed, okay? I don't think we're going to go back to the times uh, of where we got issues with meat being sacrificed to idols. Uh, go ahead. Well, if I'm trying to put this in this context, Paul talks about the division there in Corinth. Uh -huh. And then he's, he comes out of Second, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 2, I knew nothing except Christ and him crucified. Because they want to 
to drink out of one cup or whatever the issue that we come up with. The thing of it is, as Paul's saying, Christ in him crucified. Okay. Now, just, just to be clear, I'm not saying you're wrong, but I would say this. There would be some people that would take issue with you. On that. I ain't, I'm not one of them, but there would be some people that would take issue with that. And the reason I bring this up is to say I think what you're saying is true with regard to that context of Christ crucified, and I think with regard to love also, but I, th I think you can, you can apply this whole principle to a whole vast array of issues. Whereas the context of meat being sacrificed to idols, that ship has sailed. There's a whole lot of other modern-day context where this reasoning and this rationale is all very similar. How do you bring about unity with a whole myriad of belief systems and different beliefs? And I want you to think about this. I think Paul is stating, even though he doesn't state it, but he's implying that we have got to have some grace for the mind. Now, that's not a common phrase that you hear among churches of Christ. Uh, at least I haven't. Now, maybe some of you have. But, but I think we've come a long way with regard to thinking about grace, with regard to moral issues, you know? You know uh, we're very good about forgiving somebody that has an issue with, say, substance abuse. Or forgiving somebody who is just an arrogant, boorish uh, divisive individual and, and we put up with them. Or somebody who's eaten up with pride. Or somebody who's as stingy as an old miser. We can extend grace on all those fronts. And I've seen churches bend over backwards. I've seen churches that want to put on display how gracious they are with regard to moral issues. I mean, I've seen churches, in my opinion, where they celebrate people's failures so they can demonstrate how gracious they are, you know, as a church. I'm not saying that's right. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying that that's the way it is. But I would, I would argue this. Why can't we extend some grace to people's thinking? I'm going to let you in on a secret. I highly suspect that I'm wrong about something. Now, I don't know exactly what it is. Uh, or I'd change it, I think. Generally, I'd do that if I know. But I operate under the same, same assumptions with you that I figure you're wrong about something. Actually, I figure you're wrong about more than I'm wrong, but I'm not going to go there either. But uh, the only way I, you, I can expect you to put up with my, uh, with my mental foibles is for you to extend some grace to me. And the only way I know to put up with your mental foibles is to extend a little bit of grace to you. And I think that's what Paul is trying to get these people to do in 1 Corinthians 8. He says, look. He says, all, all what, you, what you knowledgeable people are stating is, is true. It's all fine, well, and good insofar as it goes. He says, some of you have got your information correct. There's only one God. But he says, guess what? Not everybody knows this. Now, what are you going to do with the brother?" What are you going to do with them? Are you just ready to cut, cut your ties with them? Kick them out because they're polytheists? They haven't, they haven't been able to work through that? They haven't been able to get over it? What about that? And he says, you, got, you have to have a little bit of grace for the mind. Now, this happened probably within the last year. I was, I was sit, sitting and talking to a brother... And he was concerned. He was concerned because he'd invited a speaker, and this speaker was a little bit more conservative than he was, and he was a little bit more concerned, or he was a little bit more conservative than maybe a lot of people in the audience that he'd invited him to speak at was. And he was worried about how the speaker was going to be perceived. And I'm sitting there listening to him, and I said, I said, don't worry about it. I said, don't worry about it. I said, do you have, and I asked him this, I said, do you have any idea of some of the crazy things your brethren believe? I said, if you could unscrew the skull cap 
on some of your brothers and sisters out there in that audience. I said, I guarantee you, you would be amazed at some of the stuff they believe. You'd just be amazed. I said, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. I said, furthermore, you know, because this is a more, this wasn't, he was worried about the, the speaker offending some of the more liberal or progressive people. I said, furthermore, if somebody comes up to you and complains about him, I said, just look at him straight in the eye and just say, isn't diversity a blessed thing? And just turn around and walk away. I said, that's all you got to do. Just tell him, isn't diversity a blessed thing? What I was trying to get across to him is that we don't have any idea what each other believes, really. We don't. I can assure you, I don't share everything. I, although some of you probably think I don't have a filter, I have a pretty good filter. Uh, I only give you about, I only, I only let about 10 or 15% slip through my filter, okay? So that means there's 90 to 85% I keep bottled up. And one of the reasons I got, have that filter is because if, if I didn't have it, none of you would even be able to stand to be around me for the 40, 40 or 45 minutes that I'm here right now. And a lot of people, most people, have a pretty good filter. I don't assume that you believe everything I believe, and you ought not to assume the same thing about me. I, I made the comment once in a class, and I, I, I wasn't making it to anybody, but I just made it a, as an off-the-cuff comment. I said, I don't feel compelled to disabuse anyone of their squirrely thoughts, you know, uh, with regard to, you know, a, a Bible class necessarily. And I remember there was an older lady, she's probably 20 years my senior, she looked at me and she says, I have a problem with that. And of course, I just let her say, you know, what she had to say, and, and I didn't even respond to it. And I'm, I, and I, but I'm sitting there thinking, if you have a problem with me not taking on everybody that disagrees with me, uh, you would really have a problem with me if I did do that. You wouldn't be able to stand me. You would not be able to stand me. I have got to have some grace for the way another person thinks. And if I can't do that, we're not going to have community. And isn't that what Paul is saying here? Or am I missing something? He's saying there's a lot of different personal beliefs within that congregation. Now, how are you going to get along? And he says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. But the man who loves God is known by God. Love. We're going to get by because we're going to love each other. And I was going to bring it I had an old uh, professor once who was trying to tell us how to survive in ministry. Uh, that didn't work either, uh, by the way. But uh, I thought his comment was good. He said, he said, don't go out there when you go to preach and wave red flags in front of the brethren. Don't go out there and wave red flags in, the bre in front of the brethren. And he also said, he says, don't go out there and tear down other people's playhouses. Just let them play in it. Let him play in it. Now, someone would say to me, I I'm sure you're sitting there thinking, well, how far do you take that? How far do you take that? Well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. But I do know that if we don't have a certain amount of grace for how people think, we're going to have all kinds of issues and all kinds of problems. You really don't want me to be an open book. You know, a lot of times you get in one of these classes where everybody wants to share, share their story and, and, and share what they think and share what they feel and everybody thinks this is going to bring about one of those happy, clappy moments, you know, where we'll all get up and do jumping jacks for Jesus and, and go out there feeling great. You don't want me to be an open book. You don't want me to be uncensored. You don't want me to be unguarded totally. If, if you think you do... All I'd have to do is spend about 30 minutes with you and I could probably get you to run out of that room screaming, get me away from this crazy nut, okay? It's my filter that, that, that maintains the possibility that we can, we can have a, a civil, normal conversation. Now, does that to mean that we should never be open? That we should never be genuine? No, but it does mean that there are differences. I mean, I'm open with, with Pat in ways that I'm not open with you. You know, I tell her things that I would never tell you. 
And I suspect most of you all are the same way. There are just certain things you don't want to share. Because why? Because they'd be divisive. You don't want to stand up and just tell everything you're, you, you, you're gonna, you've got to say if you know good and well that it's going to be divisive. Now, I will say this. Uh, I've got a brother, and I think I've told you about him before. He's a guy that was instrumental in me being where I am right now. But he's very, 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 very conservative. Uh, much more so now uh, than I am. Uh, I suspect, uh, well, he occasionally tells me he's going to come visit me, and I get very nervous because I don't know where I'll take him to church. I can't take him here because he'll think y'all are heretics, okay? Uh, I, I hate to tell you that, but he would. He'd think y'all are heretics. Uh, and I'm sitting there thinking, goodness, if he comes to visit me, where do I take him to church? Uh, I, I, you can just ponder on that for a while, and maybe you can give me some suggestions. But if I bring him here, the dinner afterwards is going to be miserable. It's just going to be miserable, you know. And I'll call him Arthur to protect his name. I don't think you'll ever meet him, let's hope. And, uh, but I, every time I'm around him, he wants to, I, I can tell he's probing he wants to, to feel me out for if I'm uh, my orthodoxy, you know, how orthodox I am. And, of course, I'm pretty good about evading questions if I want to be. He'll say something. I'll say, well, that's an interesting thought, uh, you know. Well, that, that's, that's nice. Um, that's interesting. And, you know, on and on and on. Of course, he knows I'm evading him, and that just makes him more probing, you know, more. Uh, it, it turns off to be like, you know, the Spanish Inquisition. Where, you, where you're brought up there and, and you know, you, you're wanting to give out, uh, present your orthodox credentials where you can be blessed and you can go on your way. And uh, I said that to say, that's a good example of why sometimes it's not helpful to be open. It's not helpful uh, to be unguarded. It's not necessarily helpful uh, to tell everything you believe. And I think Paul would probably say here at Corinth, you know, it's probably not real helpful for y'all to have a workshop on monotheism versus polytheism. You need to give each other some space and let people have a private area to their faith as well as a community, communal type, collective uh, dimension to their faith so you can get along and survive. Now, I've been doing a lot of talking but if, does anybody got any, anything they want to add? I mean, I, given the fact that I believe in grace for the mind, uh, feel free. Feel free to uh, just, you know, go crazy and, 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 uh, and uh, throw, don't throw any rocks, please. But you can throw all the words you want. You, you can throw all the words you want. Do you think that's a legitimate reading of 1 Corinthians 8 where Paul is trying to encourage these people with using love, even though he doesn't state it, but to talk about, look, there's more to grace than the moral dimension. There is the intellectual dimension to it. Because as I get older, I realize that what I believe today is not what I believed yesterday. And what I believe today may not be what I believe tomorrow. So there better be some grace in there because I'm going to be wrong at some point in that timeline. Okay? Go ahead. You were going to say something? It is. It absolutely is. And if we go back and, and really immerse ourselves in the nature of Christ, that's what Paul's trying to get across to these people. Mm-hmm. I believe throughout throughout the whole thing. Uh, you know. and, and might I add? I just want to add something so I'm not misunderstood. Although it doesn't really bother me too much if I'm misunderstood, because if you commu- if you communicate with human people, you're going to be misunderstood. But I don't want you to feel like this is something I'm saying to the conservatives with how they relate to people left of them. This cuts both ways. I mean, some of the most unforgiving, ungracious attitudes towards other people's thinking uh, that I've seen as of late, it's often how the left 
in our brotherhood. I'm not talking politics now. I'm talking about in our brotherhood. How the left deals with the right. You know, because it, it goes both ways. I mean, the right has been vicious at times uh, to the left. People who would just bring up a different view or a different opinion. But by the same token, some of the most condescending comments you'll hear now oftentimes are of from the left coming towards the right. Remember, the brother I was talking to who was so worried about the speaker, he was worried about what people left of the speaker, this left, left of the speaker, were going to say about that person who was more conservative. He wasn't worried about the right. He was worried about the left, you know, because we all struggle, I think, in extending grace to how, to how other people think. I remember Jimmy Allen saying something very useful. Jimmy, you know, he, he, people think of Jimmy as being very uh, uh, rigid, I think. And, and he's got that quality to him. You know, I had enough classes with him to, to realize that, that he, can, he, can, he, can, he could come off a little... Uh, strong and a little doctrinaire, but one thing you have to say for Jimmy, he changed his mind uh, on issues. And I remember something he said once. He said, he was talk I think he was talking about the war issue, actually, uh, which is not something we even discuss anymore, but, but it was a, a major issue to Jimmy because Jimmy, you know, he grew up around uh, World War II uh, and the Korean War. Uh, so, you know, it, it was a major issue and he is. And oddly enough, J.D. Bales uh, converted him to pacifism. Well, after J.D. Bales converted him to pacifism, <laughs> J.D. Bales changed his mind. And, and he, 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 began, he began to believe in, in uh, uh, just warfare. Well, there's Jimmy. Jimmy didn't change his mind again. J.D. swayed him to the pacifistic view. And then, uh, or J.D. swayed Jimmy to the pacifistic view, and then after that, J.D. changed his mind, and he went back to the just war uh, perspective uh, of the issue. And Jimmy asked the question, he said, he said, you know what? He said, if my salvation hangs on being intellectually right, he says, I was either damned before and saved now, or I was saved before, and damn now. And what was he talking about? He was just saying, man, we've got to have some grace for our intellect. It's a little bit more than having grace uh, for our moral you know, failings, uh, uh, not being able to man manage our creaturely appetites as well as we should, or not being able to keep our pride in check the way we should, but we've got to have some grace for how we think. Because the way I think now is not the way I used to think. And the way I think 20 years from now, if I'm still alive, I can almost assure you it will not be the same way. You know, you can take this down kind of a depressing road uh, because I can already, I can already see, and a lot of people would not equate this with the same thing as what I'm talking about, but it really is, it really is uh, to some extent. Our thinking changes. It's, it's like that old, old proverb, you know, that you never put your foot in the same river twice because the river has changed. Well, your mind's the same way too. I mean, my mind, I hate to admit this, it's not as sharp as it was when I was 25. Uh, I can't retain information uh, as quickly. I can't recite facts as quickly. Good grief. Yesterday, I, bet I spent four hours trying to remember the name of uh, a friend of mine's wife. And after about four hours of deliberation, it finally popped in my head, okay? And this is somebody that I actually know. And it took me nearly four hours to pull it out of my gray matter, okay? So what I'm saying is, you know, my, what I believe today is not going to be what I believe in, tw in 20 years, probably because I just, I, you know, I may just be uh, uh, slipping down into the, 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 the slippery slope of dementia. You know, that, that's very possible. And people are going to have to have grace for me there. Because if they want me to recite some state of orthodoxy, I'm not going to be able to do it. And not only that, I may be spewing heresy, uh, 
cuss words. I may be, you know, just a, the poster boy for Tourette's syndrome. No, no telling what's going to be coming out of my mouth. And you're going to have to extend grace for me. Well, say that somebody says, well, that's different. You're not culpable for that because, I mean, for crying out loud, that's, that's not your fault. But you know what? Some of my bad beliefs that I hold, some of the things that I hold in error, they're not so much my fault either. Because I can't change the way I was raised. I can't do a lobotomy on my personality. Some of the assumptions that I inherited just by breathing the air of where I grew up, I can't undo all that. Some of my emotional baggage that I bring to the Bible, I can't fix all that. I just can't fix it. Have you ever wondered, just, just to show you how fragile thinking is, and how, you know, this, this, we've had this assumption and, and, and in the Restoration Movement that if you, just, if you just throw out the Bibles and let everybody read them sincerely, we're all going to come to the same conclusion, right? That's kind of been an assumption. It's, same, it's kind of the same assumption of, of the Gideon's Bible, you know, where they put them in the, uh, it's the assumption that you, you put enough Bibles and enough motels and enough hotels that people are going to spend their whole vacation reading their Bible and they're all going to come to the same conclusion. Uh, that's probably not a good assumption, assumption to hold because we all bring different stuff to it. Uh, I think the best illustration of that is our Supreme Court. Our Supreme Court. How many of you think the reason we have so many 5-4 splits on the Supreme Court is because there are some justices that have never read the Constitution? Does anybody believe that? That, that there's some justices on the Supreme Court that have never read the Constitution, don't know what it says, you know, are just totally unaware of it. Blissfully ignorant. I don't believe that. That's nonsense. They all have read the Constitution, for crying out loud. They, they all have an understanding of legal jurisprudence. Why can't they agree? They've got a text. This text is not near as old as ours. Their text is what? A little over... 200 years old? Okay. It's a text. You got nine people. These, the, how many of you believe that they're ignorant? They're just, they're uneducated. The, the Supreme Court Justice. How many of you believe they, they disagree because they're, they're uneducated? They're just, they're just, you know, they haven't had any formal training. Well, some of them do, of course. Or some of them, I mean, because they, they, they come at things from a totally different position, obviously. I mean, they arrive at diametrically opposed positions. But it's not because they're uneducated. I mean, most all of them have been either to Yale, Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, or, or somewhere along that, and, and, have, and, have, and have clerked uh, for Supreme Court justices, have been on federal benches. It's not that they're not educated, for crying out loud. It's not that they're, they have, you know, one group has better intellectual capacity than other, but they bring different stuff to the they bring different stuff to the document, to the Constitution. They have different agendas that they bring to it. They have different assumptions that they bring to it. They have different beliefs about what they think the purpose of the Constitution is. Some of them think the purpose of the Constitution is to learn it so they can call balls and strikes. Some of them think the purpose of it is so they can expand the strike zone or shrink the strike zone. It's not just dispassionately calling balls and strikes. And the same thing is, you know, that's the Constitution. I don't get that, you know. I get a little worked up about the Constitution, but not by, like religion. I mean, religion. I mean, that's, that's, that's at the core of what we believe and who we are. If we can't get people to agree about the Constitution that was written, you know, less than 300 years ago by some of the most highly educated people, should we be surprised that we have some disagreements among ourselves about that which is most important to us, our faith, our faith and our belief in God? I'd say we shouldn't, but I would say this. The only way you'll survive in a church with all these different beliefs, and I'm, I'm telling you, I just, I just know if I could unscrew that skull cap on your head, I could see some bizarre beliefs that some of you had, and you're keeping them secret, 
and that's all right. I just assume you, you do keep them secret. But uh, I think the only way we get around, get around that is by having a good, healthy dose of grace for the mind. And in having that, I think we'll be able to, uh, to keep from tearing ourselves apart. And this is counter to a whole lot of what we grew up hearing in the Restoration Movement, I think. Uh, I think it's counter to a whole lot of what we believed in that, you know, you, you, you just put this in somebody's hand and they read it dispassionately and sincerely and they're just going to magically come out believing everything you believe. I have a good... Go ahead, Brian. One thing that sticks out to me in this passage is... I'm a heretic? Oh, I didn't say that. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. I don't think there's ever a point that we get to know as we ought to know. Yeah. We don't like gray areas. We want to arrive to a point where we say, I understand. Yeah, I agree. And I agree. It, 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 it's something that because of maybe the history of this movement coinciding so much with the, with the rise of the scientific method and all mm. that kind of stuff, we think Yeah. And I don't think it, it ever happens. Yeah. I, I mean, I would think, you know, to me, this monotheism, polytheism, you would think if there was ever an issue that, that Paul would say, look, we've we got to have unity on this. I mean, for, for goodness sake, this is crazy. But he doesn't do it. He, doesn't, he says, love them. He says, they don't have the knowledge that you have, but, you know, they believe that Jesus is the Christ and he died for them. Just love them. And uh, you don't have to fix it. You know, it may get fixed, but it might not. And, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a little almost remiss to say this. But you know who the most dangerous person to a church is? To, to church unity. It's the guy who's just read a book. You know, he just read a book about Calvinism, or he just read a book about Christology, or he just read a book about hermeneutics, or heaven forbid, he just read a book about the role of women, you know. And this guy, man, he is fired up about that issue. He's like you said, Brian, he's, he's, he believes he's come to a conclusion. And not only that, he wants everybody to come to the same conclusion he's come. I mean, he's passionate. He just read a book. He read a book about the role of women, not notwithstanding the fact that you could probably fill this whole auditorium with books about the role of women, but is that the first or second? First. But he is so excited about it and he wants to share everything about it. And here's the deal. He wants to impose his beliefs that he has just arrived at on everybody else. People that have not had the time to read that book people that are not where he is at in his knowledge base or his understanding of the issue. And it causes disunity. It's divisive a lot of times. And it's polarizing a lot of times. And, uh, and that's the problem. That's the problem. I'm going I'm to stop here, but I'm, I'm going to do what Dottie, I can see, she's telling me. She's saying, remember what you told me to remind you about Phil Slate. As I was thinking about these thoughts, you know, Phil's words came back to me. Uh, where he said that that speech he heard back in the 80s uh, was guilty of some unfinished thinking, I can assure you I'm guilty in today's class of some unfinished thinking. There are all kinds of consequences to what I'm saying, unintended consequences, maybe some positive ones, I hope, but and ones I've not even thought of. But I am guilty, I can assure you, of, unintended, uh, of unfinished thinking in this class today. But the reality is, what Phil said about that guy, that's true of almost every Bible class you'll ever hear, of every sermon you'll ever hear, of every conversation. We are all guilty of some unfinished thinking. We have not arrived at that perfect spot where we can say, We've arrived. And, you know, we've all walked around God and taken Polaroid snapshots of him. And, you know, we can describe God 
in, to, in perfection uh, uh, like, we, like we would like to think we can. So, uh, if, you, if, you, if I really offended you today by anything I said, I would ask you, just extend a little grace uh, to my failed uh, mind and uh, my failing mind uh, as well and, uh, and find it within your heart to love me anyway. And I'll try and do the same to you. And I'll try and keep my filter on full blast uh, so, you can, uh, so you can stand to be with me. And next week, I think Devin, uh, Devin will be back and, uh, and he can clean up whatever mess I've created, you know, and, and, and I'll be somewhere else. So, uh, so anyway, on that, we'll, we'll, we'll quit. Maybe a, a minute or two before the bell. Thank you. Ha! Ten seconds before the bell. <laughs>